very much, Ian. It's a great privilege to be here. Of course, I come here from Holyoke House itself, the building that was raised in memory of George Jacob Holyoke. And you know the story that he told in 1844, the weavers and workers of Rochdale, the pioneers, started a food store in a venture that has become to be seen as the first cooperative uh, in the world. And George Jacob Holyoke's book in 1857, Self Help, within six years of that being published, there were 251 cooperative societies that had started in its wake. And you go forward a few more years and you see cooperatives uh, kind of right uh, around the world. And it is an extraordinary story uh, of, uh, of course. Um, but there were cooperatives uh, kind of before then. 14 years earlier, um, local flannel weavers had formed the Rochdale Friendly Cooperative uh, Society uh, after a, uh, a strike focusing on uh, sickness benefits, started a small library services. In 1833, they started a, a shop and the shop failed, uh, as did a number of ventures around the time because it gave too much credit uh, to its members. And the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers, after uh, kind of another year, another kind of period of a, of a strike, was their next go uh, kind of at it. They raised £28 in capital collecting, uh, two pennies a week from members, and they registered it with the Registrar of Friendly Societies, an important role, uh, in October 1844. So that is very close. It is worth remembering that the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers emerged from a context of quite extraordinary poverty. And, and we know this for uh, the town of Rochdale because the MP, Sharman Crawford, uh, collected the data and spoke to it, so it was captured uh, in Hansard. The average earning, six pounds uh, per week, that's in today's equivalent, sorry, not then. Uh, majority of families had no more than one blanket. Crawford reported the stories were common of weavers wearing rags, weavers wearing rags. It's like starving farmers. Weavers wearing rags, working 16 hours a day and surviving on a meagre diet of oats, onion porridge, potato and treacle. So the life expectancy in a town with 25,000 people was just 21. The average age of the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers when the store opened was 25. And now there's, since that time, there have been hundreds of stories that have uh, told and retold that story, whether of individual businesses or cooperative sectors here or around the world. Uh, Nick Matthews, Chair of Cooperatives UK, received uh, an award on Friday night from the German cooperative movement paying tribute uh, to the Rochdale pioneers uh, as a source of inspiration uh, kind of for them. But there were, as I say, precursors, um, not least and, and not excluding uh, the weavers in Fenwick uh, in the 18th uh, century. And what I want to do in this talk, because that's what the talk I've been given most of my time, I'm talking about <coughs> cooperatives of the future, uh, is to talk about some of those precursors of cooperation uh, and mutuality. So while giving rightly all credit due to the Rochdale pioneers, also to acknowledge the risk in just choosing one moment. It's what the uh, historian Frank Trentman, Frank Trentman, author of The Empire of Things in Birkbeck uh, College, describes as uh, the tunnel vision that can come with a birth metaphor, the way that historians like to trace things to their roots and say it started then, but that concept may obscure as much as it, uh, as it shows. 
And it seems to me that it's quite right for us in the UK to do something like this in, in this lecture, given the credit that we tend to get on the shoulders of those earlier giants. So what I'm going to do through this lecture is to give you 12 early acts of cooperation and, uh, and mutuality, uh, and a flavour of the ways in which cooperation and mutuality has been uh, reinvented uh, over, uh, over time. So there will be 12, you'll be able to mark the progress as we go. Towards the end is a remarkable story of uh, a cooperative community started by uh, prisoners uh, in the coals of uh, Siberia. So uh, if you're feeling the heat, then you have a little bit of Siberia later in the evening to go. Uh, it's worth starting just briefly with definitions uh, because when we're talking about cooperatives as a noun, we're meaning institutions that exemplify cooperation as another noun that is obviously far wider uh, in, in scope. So before I went about this, which was done in kind of evenings in, in, in Manchester, um, I think with the support of my chair at the time, uh, and um, is published as a free to download uh, kind of book called A Short History of Cooperation and, uh, and Mutuality. So I've chosen 12 from that kind of longer list. But in order to set the scope for the view, I needed to have some idea of what was in scope and, and what was not. And we, so we start from the idea that actually cooperation is central to the human story. It's central to uh, human evolution. Uh, we are, in, in the words of those uh, kind of brilliant uh, economists, radical economists, um, Samuel Bowles and Herbert Gintis, we are, are a cooperative uh, species. And that idea of cooperation as marking out uh, the human uh, kind of story has been charted by many. The anthropologist uh, Margaret uh, kind of Mead and others looking at cooperation in tribes. That's a notion of kind of cultural patterns which is criticised uh, by, uh, by some. But I kind of shortcut it to say that in the era of early hu human evolution, our predecessors were organised for very long periods of time into small scale, stateless societies. And those conditions have cemented cooperation into our patterns of social uh, interaction. Something is not just a way for individuals to get on or to get ahead, but something that is deeply internalised into our norms of uh, kind of fairness and realised in our emotions from shame uh, to, uh, to, to joy. Now, uh, Samuel Bowles and Herb Gintis actually, um, in, in their uh, book on a cooperative species, um, marry together some of the evidence uh, kind of from uh, archaeology uh, and from the history as it exists uh, with, with game theory. So what they do is they model this, these kinds of small state groups and look at cooperation and the way that cooperation would have emerged through that. And it's worth just saying that this is cooperation, not just in a sense that I am nice to you, sir, but that I will punish you, Richard, if you step out of line. But actually, we watch to see people that might be breaking the rules. That's why we watch so many detective stories on TV. It's our innate cooperation, spotting the transgressors. And we are willing to punish people that misbehave even at a cost to ourselves, and that is also, in kind of game theory, a, uh, a form of, uh, of cooperation. <coughs> Others have looked at some of this. Uh, Eleanor Ostrom, uh, in the no Nobel Prize winning or sharing uh, economist, her last work was an extraordinary work called Understanding Institutional uh, Diversity, and it was, it was an attempt to create 
a grand theory of human organization. Uh, what forms of institutions emerge in, uh, in what uh, kind of settings? And it, it probably was still work that needs to be completed and uh, carried forward. But many of the things that Eleanor Ostrom points to are, relate to things that are quite hard to test when we look back in time because they're actually about culture. Uh, and when you're looking at institutions, even the word institution is a, is a complicated notion if you kind of carry it forward, you can see some of the hard ways in which institutions might have been set up like rules, but the soft side, the culture of how people are really related is very, very hard uh, to gauge. So in short, I found a definition that I worked to that characterised the 12 that you have, uh, you have before you this evening, and that is that cooperative and mutual action is about people working together equitably as members of a formal and open body to meet their economic and wider needs. Uh, and the reason why I've started with a, a, a wider definition than the statement of cooperative identity, for example, which can be traced back to the Rochdale pioneers them, them, themselves, um, is because I am trying to look back and I'm not trying to tell a story that says, well, actually, it wasn't the Rochdale pioneers that was the first co-op. It was this um, red dye cooperative in Greece uh, or this burial society in ancient Rome. I'm not trying to push back our notions of when the first co-op was, because that would compound it. I'm trying to look at what went before and what the strands and the comparisons uh, kind of may be. So in order to do that, this lecture is part of Cooperative Fortnight. Today is the launch of Cooperative Fortnight. You are celebrating cooperation with co-ops up and down the UK, and we are in two weeks that leads up to the International Day of Cooperatives, um, backed by the United Nations, uh, can they know less, on Saturday, July the 6th. It's a special day as well, because today the International Labour Organization, the ILO, which is itself 100 years old, has signed a, a, a renewed partnership agreement with the International Cooperative Alliance, out of recognition for the work of the 2.9 million cooperatives worldwide, uh, over 1 billion member owners, uh, and contribution that we make to sustainable development goals and to decent work. So I'm glad I put that holding slide in, lest I get too carried away into the history. But we've got 12 to go, and we're going to start in the 4th century uh, BCE uh, in, uh, in China. It's actually a photograph is not taken from that time. <laughs> you will see that I have made no effort uh, for historical accuracy in the uh, imagery. Um, but a writer, um, uh, Mencius or Menke, writes uh, at that time uh, in his book, Mencius, uh, about market traders who were coming together to exchange in town with rules and officials chosen to oversee the process. And it's that short. That's all we know. But I love the idea that markets predate modern, particularly neoliberal market economists by many hundreds, probably thousands of years. And at their heart, markets require cooperation to be able to work people coming together uh, in a place, people operating according uh, to, uh, to rules. So that is my first one, and it is the furthest back that I'm able to chart. In the ones that go forward, we're not following a, a, a set timeline, so we're not going to be in the 5th century uh, BCE uh, for the next one, but I'm starting with some of the, uh, the older ones. And the next one comes from uh, India, where there is a very long uh, tradition of communities collaborating to sustain 
uh, local assets like uh, village tanks uh, or, or forests. Uh, and the fads of Kolapur saw farmers taking control of water resources collectively to ensure fair access and collaborating around uh, the use of that harvest and then also then transport uh, of produce to market. And in, in that region, uh, most of the rains uh, in Karnataka come during, obviously, during the monsoon season. Uh, and the impact of rains on farming is, or can be crippling, gone wrong. So the rationale for acting collectively to secure rainwater has always been strong. And what we have is an inscription uh, from the year 1371 describing the contribution of villagers in Nanjapura in the form of the upkeep uh, of a water tank and the maintenance of it uh, and villagers providing four bullock carts in order to do that. We now move to ancient Rome and the, uh, the, the organisation form uh, that uh, in Latin we have the collegia and a direct uh, antecedent therefore of our word uh, college um, and in Latin joined together that, that's what a college uh, kind of means and across the Roman Empire collegia would be bands uh, or troops of uh, arts or of workers, silver workers rag dealers um, woodsmen some were burial societies and that was supporting members at a time of uh, financial cost as well as religious and cultural significance you, you can't just let people die where, be buried where they die it has to be out of town uh, with the right uh, kind of offerings and the right cultural process and burials were some uh, costs now we know of, again from uh, inscriptions, papyri and, 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 and writings, of a huge and extraordinary variety uh, of these kinds of groups, these kinds of bodies, absolutely not all going under the name of Collegia whatsoever. In fact, the names uh, abound in uh, huge ways. And those go back to the kind of you know fifth century or earlier uh, in Greek time. One estimate by an academic of the different <coughs> terms used of different associations around the time is two and a half thousand associations, and they would have included religious confraternities, chapters of priests, sodalities, uh, Jewish synagogue, and on some characterizations, the earliest uh, Christian uh, associations. Um, uh, the vicar close to where I live. Uh, is would point to acts as those early Christian communities uh, he would call them uh, co-ops and I don't have it in my heart to you know, correct him on any of that but it was about common uh, ownership as well as association now the example of Caligia which um, I can give uh, comes uh, a stone throw from the walls uh, of, uh, of, of Rome and again the statutes uh, of these are, you know, are, are preserved in um, inscriptions. It's kind of interesting thing about inscriptions as well. <coughs> Here is from a co-op that has a, uh, a Twitter handle. Okay, thank you. Um, it is the Society for Cultural Studies, I know. Uh, Facebook site. Okay, very good. Um, anything in stone? <laughs> <laughs> Well, actually, this seems to be the best way to make sure that you are kind of preserved in, in, uh, in history. And it, it's not just the sort of malign influence of big tech or, uh, uh, or Facebook. And um, this one uh, college uh, was founded by uh, a Roman woman called Salvia Marcellina. It was the Collegium of Iscolopus, Is Iscolopius and Hygia founded in 153 uh, AD. And, and this had a, a dual or a triple function. It was a, a dining society, and Romans enjoyed their dining societies. 
And it was a burial society. So if you were a member, then your funeral costs were covered. It also lent money uh, to, uh, to members using the interest uh, to pay its uh, expenses. Uh, the college had a president. The officers were called caretakers. And the body of regular members uh, were termed uh, the people. And what I quite like about those terms is that it echoes uh, modern uh, cooperative societies with the term society. That actually the idea is almost to envision a way that society can be organised. That's why the Rochdale Equitable Pioneers welcomed women in far in advance of women having the vote in wider society because the society they were creating uh, was the society that they uh, wanted to create. And we simply don't know whether that idealism was carried through in the Roman Collegia. And there are different views, but there's a lack of evidence above all. But there is also in Roman society a deep resistance to the notion of, uh, of equality. Pliny the Younger put it, nothing could be more distressingly inequitable than unflinching equality of all. So in, in Augustan times, seats in the theatre were organised by rank. And even where you had uh, dining societies, collegia, of slaves, they may also have had some of these ranks and cultural differences and inequalities uh, that are, are there. But we can only really uh, guess on this. Now the fourth one takes us uh, to the uh, Islamic world. And from the late 18th century, um, a range of uh, innovations in uh, legal and institutional form came in through the Islamic world allowing people to kind of co-invest and share returns on an agreed basis, uh, to, share lo to share losses and act as surety for other partners, and to act on a mutual basis uh, kind of uh, with them. Uh, one commentator argues that actually some of those innovations um, of the Islamic world from the late 18th century didn't arrive in Western Europe uh, until several centuries uh, kind of later. The term often used, sharika or al shirka means in effect a sharing, a co-partnership. In the most comprehensive form, uh, offered members equal rights in economic terms and an equal say in terms of the ability to act on behalf uh, of, the, of the partnership. And interestingly enough, that, that equality is carried through in some of the early companies in a Western European context. Um, in France, there was the Compagnie de la Nouvelle France. Uh, Nouvelle France was Canada and New England, as it later became uh, kind of known. But it was a hundred people formed uh, in a partnership to explore trade in furs. And again, it operated on the basis of one member, one vote. Now, the fact that Cardinal Richelieu happened to be one of those members, and you might decide to vote with him, obviously, is. A, a, a cultural thing which we can only guess with. But the early partnerships and companies formed by merchants uh, elsewhere also followed uh, that principle of one member, one vote uh, from the 15th century. Uh, Adam Smith uh, in Wealth of Nat Nations uh, talks, well, there's the one member, one vote side, he also talks about an open door principle where firms are obliged to admit anybody that's properly qualified upon pay paying a certain fine. And that's kind of intriguing, because it maybe throws up the idea that actually the cooperative form in the 19th century need to be, had to be recreated, because in its original form, it was actually subverted towards one pound, one vote, and the dominance of, of economic uh, interests at an earlier uh, point. Number five, the workshop. Again, 
One of my favourites because uh, I have the privilege to work with cooperatives across Europe. I'm, I'm on the board of the network, the regional network of International Cooperative Alliance, Cooperatives Europe. And so work very closely with uh, cooperators from uh, Turkey. Uh, and it is through those relationships and contacts uh, that I learned about the uh, Ahi movement in Anatolia, uh, modern Turkey. Ahi means generous uh, or open-handed. And this was started by a kind of wave of uh, uh, immigrants uh, in the 30th uh, century. Uh, immigrants coming in from Turkmenistan, uh, Genghis Khan wasn't known for his cooperative tendencies, uh, <laughs> was invading and into Anatolia came uh, these people from further in the, uh, in the east. And Pierre Ahi Evran Naveli was a master leather craftsman he was, uh, and a scholar and he was born in uh, Iran in the year 1169. And what he envisaged and created as an organising model for those uh, migrant communities um, was a world of guilds, that workshops that were connected and operating in a context of uh, ethics and faith that could create peaceful, friendly, again that's a word that we know uh, from uh, our own UK context later, a kind of friendly context uh, across the economy uh, and across uh, society. Uh, Ahi Evran himself un unfortunately died at the end of his life at the hand of uh, Mongols who were encroaching further, uh, but in 1261. And the first was a leather workshop established in uh, Kayseri in central uh, Anatolia. And in some ways it's, it's typical to many of the guilds that you, you would have found uh, around the time or, or kind of later. There was an economic base to it. Um, it was craftsmen working together in bazaars, so bringing people together uh, in, a, uh, in a bazaar. Uh, each of them would also have a kind of baker and a barber shop next to the, uh, to the, the bazaar. And they would check the quality of materials, the techniques uh, for production. They would inspect, run inspections, and they would set uh, kind of prices. And there were around 32 on one analysis, different trades and crafts and arts. And each of them had their own symbols, so a, a silver horseshoe, for example, for, uh, for farriers. Uh, the wife of Ahi Evran, Fatma Bachi, established a bazaar uh, for women, um, allowing them to group together and to sell the goods that uh, they produced. And again, under, underneath this lies a a, a deep faith commitment that this was a, a way of living your life in line with uh, the Quran, in line with uh, the precepts and the principles that were set out. And the guild elder, by the way, was called the Ahi Baba. And we don't know whether that's the Ali Baba uh, of Arabian Nights uh, or, or not, but I'd like to think it might be. Number six, halfway prisoners still to come, we have the reintroduction in the past of credit unions. And uh, on Saturday I listened to uh, one of our members, uh, Robert Kelly of the um, uh, ABCL, the Association of British Credit Unions, talk about the state of credit unions and bemoan the fact that not enough people know about credit unions or know what a credit union is or know what a cooperative is, to be honest. Um, and one of the reasons may be that actually the credit union has been invented and reinvented so many times across different countries and in different names. And at the heart of it is this idea of a lending circle, that we might re reorganise the chairs in this room into a circle and that the lending would be and the borrowing would be between members of the circle on an equitable basis, uh, either in a time-limited way, where we go around once and stop, or in a continuing way. And rotating savings and credit associations that uh, would be known as in the academic literature, but here are some of the names. Tontine in West Africa, 
Muzikis in the D Democratic Republic of Congo, Ika in Ethiopia, Stockwell in South Africa, Mukando in Zimbabwe, Tandas and Kudina in Mexico, Chits, Curries and Bishis in India, and my favourite, Thong Thing in Cambodia. The Credit Union. Now, what did these early co-ops ever do for us? <laughs> well, number seven is the Artists Guild. And I've talked a little bit about guilds in, in Turkey. The guilds in uh, Western Europe emerged really in the 11th century. And to become a master, um, a guild apprentice needed to complete a masterpiece of course, and that's where the word comes from, passed by its quality for the guild. And the Dutch masters were an extraordinary generation of painters in the Netherlands, but they were also masters uh, of the guilds. Their patron saint uh, was uh, St. Luke. But with patronage, church patronage in decline uh, in the Low Countries, in, in Calvinist times, the guilds of St. Luke turned entirely entrepreneurially to domestic customers, and they developed an extraordinary market uh, for art. Uh, so by 1660, which is the year that Vermeer died and Rembrandt completed his last etching, there were 45,000 paintings estimated to hang on the walls of homes in the one town, the one city, uh, of Delft uh, alone. So the Dutch masters were indeed guild masters. The Labour Society, number eight, again, really one of my favourites because the Shaw Porters Society of Aberdeen still exists. It continues uh, to this day. It dates back to 1498, possibly earlier, I'll come back to that possibly earlier, um, as porters on the docks of Aberdeen, carrying goods from ships. And it, today it is a home removals firm. <laughs> it's lost some of its mutuality, but it retains that extraordinary uh, lineage that is there. It made me think actually, interestingly, I, I don't know, I don't want to put you on the spot here, but do you know the oldest organisation that is on the register of cooperative and community benefit societies. The oldest thing on the mutual register is 1809, and it's a friendly society. That's fabulous. I would suggest that it's, and this is outside of your day job, <laughs> that it's the Dartford Cricket Club, uh, which converted to a formal cooperative society, or community benefit society, one of those two, uh, relatively recently, but dates back at least to 1723. So there is this extraordinary lineage to some of these organisations that continue today, even though they predated uh, the Rochdale uh, Equitable Pioneers. The Pioneers uh, were Scots for a, uh, a porter. And in fact, one of the first members that we have a name for uh, is that of a woman, Maggie. Todd, uh, in 1514. So in a trade that required strength and skill, women could still find uh, a place. Now there's a charter from the time of Queen Anne which talks about privileges uh, being granted uh, in the time of uh, William, sometime King of Scotland, William the Lion, uh, who was crowned on Christmas Eve in 1165. So actually the society could date earlier. And it seems likely that actually the society was established um, probably by the city authorities, or they certainly oversee the operations. The relationship between guilds and between <coughs> the authorities uh, is always um, a variable one. Um, in France at a time later on, the guilds started to become known as Shows du roi, things of the king, because they were seen as a way for royal patronage to be able to have an effect. Whereas in Florence, after the riots and the democratic 
kind of fervor, they were clearly democratic and uh, far ahead of their, of their time. But it is clear that actually it's it, the independence of it certainly uh, emerged. In 1531, uh, members like Will Grant were named as uh, standing as guarantors for the society uh, as, a, uh, as a whole. And we've got records of people being elected as, uh, as, as, as deacons on an annual uh, basis to manage the property of the society and to chair uh, kind of chair meetings. The annual general meetings, by the way, of the guilds used to be on saints' days, because this is in Western Europe, because they used to have a patron saint, so on saints' days people were off work, so you'd gather, you'd have a feast, uh, and then you would do the formal business of, uh, of electing or, or ratifying the officers. And uh, often when I'm, many of our members come to me and say, well, how do we make our AGM more exciting? And the word feast always does it uh, really for uh, for me. It's interesting perhaps though, just to look at the because um, I spent too much time in economics just to look at the rationale why is this mutual, if we use that word loosely, why is this mutual operating, why is it needed and here's the case um, shipping doesn't come in on a steady basis, it comes in from time to time and you know it's like buses, you wait for a one bus, you get three, you wait for one ship, you get three. So in order to provide a service to those ships, actually you needed to be able to cover porters to have quite a lot of downtime. And they used to have their downtime, used to play a lot of cards. Apparently there was too much drinking. At one point the city authorities banned the porters uh, from drinking. And you can imagine that drinking and uh, portering probably didn't go too well uh, t together. So they would guarantee that there were porters even if there was that downtime. They also guarantee fair rates uh, for shipping, attracting ships to come into the docks uh, in Aberdeen. The rates were one Scots penny uh, barrel uh, from the quay. And if you went beyond the Braid gutter, now Broad Street, uh, that was two, uh, two penny Scots. And it provided for redress as well, because the thing about barrels is that they're round. It's very tempting just to roll them down the street, but the streets were not in good state, and if you do that with barrels, they don't last. So actually redress collectively where porters uh, uh, cause damages. Those were the functions that you could see could you be uniquely provided by a mutual venture that you couldn't do in the same kind of way. Interestingly enough, in other places in Antwerp, uh, the natties, the porters are organised uh, into societies. Uh, on one analysis, they have uh, again the characteristics of one member, one vote, uh, member subscriptions, uh, and in, and again the sharing uh, of, of benefits. Number nine, uh, the women's guild, and I've talked about uh, one or two women in the course uh, of these examples uh, so far. Um, of course, many of the examples that we're talking about were set in deeply patriarchal uh, societies with patriarchal uh, norms. And we've got examples of guilds uh, that have explicit laws uh, against women uh, becoming members in, in Germany, uh, for example. But there are also examples of those laws being flouted. Um, and initiatives as well to recognise women. And in uh, 1675, the seamstresses of Paris came together to set up a guild that entitled them to sew and sell clothes for women and for children. And in other French towns, again, at the same time, or around the same time, Rouen, Le Havre, Caen, Lyon, there's again evidence of active female participation uh, in in guilds. And in 1628, again, one of my favourites in Barcelona, over 40 women who were spinners broke into the city hall uh, to protest uh, councillors and they threw insults at the councillors uh, in protest at the action of the master drapers who were sending wool to be spun outside uh, of, the, uh, of the city. Sewing and, of course, insurance. Um, 
from cow societies to, to protect against your cow getting sick, uh, uh, death guilds to protect against uh, funeral costs, uh, like the burial societies, or, or fire guilds, forming to pool risks and provide assistance uh, against those risks, uh, whatever they may be. The first one that I have found uh, was from Schleswig Holstein uh, in 1537. Uh, we've got lovely evidence in 1752 from the States of, uh, from Benjamin Franklin, uh, the great uh, politician and, uh, and uh, scientist, uh, who founded arguably America's first mutual uh, Philadelphia contributorship of insurance of houses from loss by fire. And this was modelled on something that he'd seen uh, in London, uh, at the amicable contributorship of London. Uh, in his time uh, then. And I guess if you were in London any time after 1666, being aware of the risks of fire was certainly something that was big. Let me take you to my favourite cheese, uh, which is produced today by uh, cooperatives uh, in the Comte region. Uh, and something that goes back also with some of that cooperative governance of the Appellation and protection of, of origin uh, for cheeses and for wines too uh, in the Franche-Comte region and the Alps region uh, as well uh, of, of Switzerland. And from the 14th century, uh, thanks again in this case to materials shared with me through our French sister organisation, um, we have the emergence of what's called fruitier, uh, fruitier, sorry I should get my accent right, but essentially ripening uh, societies. And they were a way for neighbours to pool milk uh, to produce cheese. Um, so like worker co-ops, we might think today, pool their labour or uh, farmer co-ops. This is pooling milk. Uh, and you got cheese uh, according to your turn or your share of the milk that you had uh, kind of put uh, in uh, today. Uh, George Jacob Holio said that Gruyere should be the favourite cheese of cooperatives <laughs> because it was produced uh, in a long time on that basis. And indeed, George A. Capriot himself wrote about some of these early uh, histories. We are here at number 12. So you have heard examples from right across. And I want to take you to the coals uh, of Russia. On 14th of December, 1825, on the accession of Tsar Nicholas I, there was an uprising of arms uh, by guards officers in Senate Square, St. Petersburg. I guess there's a, there's a, you know, something, a truism here that we could say that behind every revolution may be an earlier failed revolution. And this was a revolution that failed. The revolt was put down, and the rebels were sentenced to exile and hard labour in Siberia. The Tsar sent special orders to make life as hard as possible for them. And you can imagine it would not have been easy anyway. In Siberia, they were, um, according to one of them, packed like herrings in a barrel, in prison barracks. Nikolai Basagin, one of those exiles, uh, recounted later that each man had half a metre on which to sleep on the plank, so that in turning onto one side during the night, you necessarily had to knock your neighbour, especially as we wore chains, which were not taken off at night, and which made an extraordinary noise and caused a real pain with every careless movement. But he went on to say, is there anything to which youth cannot grow accustomed. What can it not endure? We all slept as well as in luxurious beds or on feather mattresses. But there, in harsh conditions and driven by hunger, desperation, and possibly or probably with some connivance from local authorities that were more distant from the Tsar and not entirely sympathetic, 
they formed the Great Artel. It was a form of uh, community uh, or mutual, in effect, to get by. Uh, they shared food parcels coming in. They fenced off lands next to the prison and started to produce uh, clothing. They saved money. They offered credit and did well enough even to sell potatoes and beetroot back to peasants uh, in the area. But one this mutual support represented, quotes, a revival of the Christian commune, something we've heard of uh, earlier. And I love this from uh, Piotr Svistunov in a letter from September 1831. Recall we're still 13 years before our, our modern cooperative uh, start in 1844. He said, this really is our Lilliputian state. Every year, by means of a majority in a secret ballot, we elect a ruler who will enact the will of the people. A Lilliputian state. Again, I rather love that. Small is beautiful. Small is also uh, cooperative. And, and these arrangements, then over the period of time, and with the involvement and support of the prisoners' wives, and, and their story is also an extraordinary uh, story of hardship and uh, endurance and of uh, cooperation. Um, this working allowed them to develop their talents, uh, as in all the great cooperatives, like the Edinburgh Student Housing Co-op today, whose members in a 104-bed student co-op house come in, maybe age 19, some of whom have never picked up a drill in their life, and they've put down and redone a basement that's now being used as a community space uh, in Edinburgh. Same way, unlocking skills and unlocking uh, talents. So craftsmen appeared whose work, according to one uh, of those, could rival those of the craftsmen in St. Petersburg. And one of the great talents was Nikolai Bestuso, who was in there with his brother, uh, Mikhail. And he made clocks, shoes, toys, cradles, coffins, as well as doing an impressive series of portraits of the rebels called the Decemberists after the December uh, kind of revolution. And the venture helped them, or some of them, those that lived uh, to see their freedom on the death of Tsar Nicholas in 1856. So some died there, some lived on and, 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 and spread across Russia. But I find these words very moving. And it's... Um, words on the death of his comrade there in the Great Artel, Nikolai Muriayev, Sergei Volonsky uh, wrote the following. It is not said to die so much a pity that there is not one single grave for the bones of us all, the bones of all of us disgraced individuals, separated we are like all people, we are specks of dust, but clustered together our bones would, with a bit of good fortune, be a worthy funeral feast for future generations. An extraordinary tribute to the collective spirit of people living together, that idea that actually they might also die together or be collected. Uh, in death. So these are the 12 examples that I have to offer you. And I just then will close with some thoughts about what do we learn from some of these. And I repeat the point that I've been very open in my approach and my definition, because I've had to be. If we just took the seven cooperative principles and tried to extend them back in time, it would be impossible to judge. Why? Because cooperative and mutual societies don't leave bones like fossils. We simply don't know so much of the way that they operated in reality. And what we do know is often things like the rules 
or a view from outside. We can't really say how they worked uh, in many uh, kind of ways uh, at, at all. That's certainly the case. Secondly, that I try to keep a, a weather eye on examples that have an economic dimension. But if you go out more widely, simply to associations that are democratic and that have members, of course you have a far wider canvas uh, still. On one estimate in the 18th century, there were remarkable 25,000 clubs and societies meeting in the English-speaking world. Social clubs, art societies, debating clubs, book societies, alumni, Freemasons, horticultural societies, music societies, sports clubs, professional bodies, philanthropic, political associations, trades unions, religious bodies, scientific and learning societies, so many of those. And so trying to keep a, a weather eye on the economic dimension is what I've tried to do, but that itself is not easy, because the economic dimension is deeply embedded in a social and often a faith view of the world of the time. So I haven't uh, covered, uh, for example, uh, monasteries. Uh, even though monasteries were involved in economic life, uh, you know, deeply so. And if you take the precepts of St. Benedict from the uh, 6th century AD, those precepts on communal life and work, were intended for any Christian community, not just a, a, a monastery, are, are deeply collected in orientation. Uh, again, you could look at the scientific societies, very open. Uh, you know, connections across the Napoleonic Wars when countries were at war, very open, democratic, but not really economic in orientation. So I try to draw that line with the idea that the line is helpful if it illuminates more than it obscures. But all of these things, I think, could be up to date. If there is a single golden thread or one or two golden threads, um, it would be in the words that I found uh, from Ivan Illich, that great uh, uh, narrator of institutions and critic of institutions, that he described um, so many of these, particularly the guilds, uh, as fundamentally about work, as an attempt by specialists to determine how their work should be done uh, and by who. You could take a different cut, which might be about shared needs, about people coming together to defend their livelihoods or promote uh, their consumption. Either way, that's an interesting factor. Another one is what succeeds and what doesn't, and how do those change over time? And there's something here about a relationship between these precursors and the powers that are outside that they are open to challenge or subversion from powers, those with power outside. They're also open to challenge from those without power. The city of London was suffused with these guilds that suffocated uh, enterprise and people fled to the, uh, what I think of as, as the kind of clean air, the fresh air and the freedoms of South London. Uh, in, but you might dispute that. But that idea, and if you you know if you think about the wife of Bath, you know uh, who who wants to be known as uh, Madame, my lady, um, and the the clothing, you know the the, the sumptuary uh, privileges of the guildsmen, you know. So the challenges from those without power, uh, as uh, as you know as as well. And in a sense, I have. The idea, again, then you've got the inside, the kind of benefit to those inside, but managing those tensions. There's possibly something here, a kind of evolutionary idea, about those ventures, cooperative or mutual ventures, in inverted commas, that have the right fit for their environment, they inhabit, the right fit of internal cohesion and external uh, openness uh, or, uh, or engagement. So all we can do is track back the evidence trail for where we see some of these things. 
the evidence for many of these precursors is stronger in Europe. But that does not mean that cooperation and mutuality is Europe in origin, because we see evidence that goes beyond uh, kind of that. I mean, even today, you could argue that the, you know, the, the rules and the principles represent an ideal rather than a reality. Um, so again, we shouldn't I idealize or romanticize where we are compared to where some of these precursors may be. But what do I conclude in terms of the nature uh, of cooperation? And what I conclude is that, at least from our 12 examples of cooperation, that it's not the case that these initiatives, these ventures over time, have each and every one of the characteristics that we would describe as those uh, of a uh, modern cooperative. But in fact, the opposite. That what I conclude is that there's been a diversity of cooperative and mutual forms that have succeeded uh, over time. Some briefly, some for longer periods of time, all with their own mix of characteristics, some shared. And so cooperation emerges as adaptable and capable of reinvention to fit new contexts and new needs. And Raymond Williams, it was, who argued that the ways in which so-called ordinary people have had in terms of getting together in cooperation are cultural achievements to be taken as seriously as the paintings or other works of art. And in the mid 20th century, writing for Cooperatives UK, the Cooperative Union then, GDH Cole argued that the cooperation is timeless. There's no saying when or by whom the first at such attempt at such cooperation uh, was made. And I think what that means is that today's cooperatives, we shouldn't lock ourselves into a view that, they, that tomorrow's cooperatives will look the same or obey the same rules or principles, that we need to be open to the idea that there is a deeper pattern of mutuality that is significant and recurrent in the way that people choose to uh, organise. Thank you very much indeed.